Hello. Welcome back to another episode of The Delicious Legacy, an archaeogastronomical adventure through the ages and continents. And I'm very excited, of course, today, because we are continuing our deep journey to the history of chocolate and the cacao tree in uh, ancient Mesoamerica. We're going to see how the Mayans and later on the Aztecs used uh, the chocolate and how they drank it. And it's worth mentioning here that ancient Mayans were the ones who invented chocolate, but chocolate as a drink, not chocolate as a bar as we know it nowadays. So for them it was a, a drink. Yes, sometimes it was spiced with other things, and yes, most of the people regardless of the class, they were drinking chocolate, but yeah, it was a drink. We don't really have much indication that chocolate, cacao powder, was used in terms of um, other culinary recipes. And just to recap, um, the Mayans uh, lived and thrived um, in uh, the area south of uh, southern Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, what's today part of Guatemala, and the Chiapas region in Mexico, and Tabasco region in Mexico, Honduras, and all this area. And there, they created a really amazing civilization with many, many cities and huge monuments that a lot of them, they're still buried um, under um, uh, the jungle. Aside from the chocolate, a lot of um, staple foods today originated from um, the area of uh, Mexico. And more importantly, of course, it's the chilies, all the varieties of chilies that we have. Corn, which um, still today in Mexico, and especially in the Mayan region, they have uh, so many different varieties of uh, uh, corn and different colors and different textures and really great uh, vegetable. Tomatoes, chocolate, of course, as we just said. Turkeys, uh, squashes, all the stuff um, comes from that region, really. And finally, it's worth noting that um, chocolate is used in a lot of Creole and modern Mexican recipes. And by using the word modern, what I mean is um, like the past, like traditional recipes of uh, Mexican people, indigenous Mexican people today. But yeah, the recipes passed um, down the last 100, 150, 200 years. So yes, chocolate is used as an ingredient in foods and it's traditional Mexican foods, but it's not really... We don't really have this connection with ancient Mayans and Aztecs. We don't have the evidence that it's been used in many recipes, which is a problem mainly because um, when the Spanish conquistadors invaded, finally the Mayan uh, lowlands uh, destroyed much of the written evidence. Well, almost all of the written evidence of the Mayan civilization, because they considered them uh, heathens and um, it was um, against uh, uh, the word of the god. So yeah, we might have had some more evidence about it, but there's only four documents that they survive from the Mayan age. And there's only four codices surviving to this day, and uh, these four are the Dresden Codex, the Madrid Codex, Paris Codex, and the Maya Codex of uh, Mexico. Of course, who knows, in the future we might discover some more. Bernal Diaz del Castillo lamented thus, let us turn to the province of Soconusco, which lies between Guatemala and Oaxaca. In the year 1525, I was traveling through it for eight or ten days, and it used to be peopled by more than 50,000 heads of households, and they had their houses and very good orchards of cacao tree, and it was very pleasant. And now, in the year 1578, it is so desolate and abandoned that there are no more than 1,200 inhabitants in it. Of course, if you're interested uh, to find a lot more detailed information about the history of chocolate, especially the ancient history of chocolate, there's a book called The True History of Chocolate by Michael and Sophie Coe. Uh, it was released, um, I think, 1996? Yeah, a couple of um, really brilliant um, American academics, basically. So yeah, check it out and uh, find it out and uh, read 
in much more detail of all this stuff we will be talking today in this episode. I love this uh, story from Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Mayans of the Guatemalan Highlands, which was written uh, down not long before the conquest uh, of the Spanish conquistadors. And um, archaeologists think that it's a translation from a now lost hieroglyphic text. So basically, this story, to say it briefly, concerns uh, the first set of twins of the old couple who have created the universe, uh, which they meet that ultimately end at uh, Xibalba, the Mayan underworld, where they are beheaded by the sinister lords of the dread place. So the severed head uh, of one of these unlucky twins, uh, which is later on known as the maze god, is hung up in a tree, which uh, pictured as a cacao tree on a classic Maya vase. One day, this disembodied head magically impregnates the daughter of uh, Exilaban ruler as she holds up uh, her hand to it. So she is expelled in disgrace to the Earth's surface, and she eventually gives birth to the second divine pair, the hero twins, which we saw in our first uh, in the first episode of the podcast, Xunahpu and uh, Xabalanke. And following a series of exploits, reminiscent of the, the labels of Hercules, more or less, let's say, to compare it to European uh, mythical traditions. So yeah, well, when uh, they do a series of exploits, the hero twins go to defeat uh, Xibalba and its ghastly denizens. And um, then the final task is to resurrect uh, the slain father, the maze god. And this having been accomplished, they rise to the sky in glory as the sun and the moon. And um, according to people more knowledgeable than me, this story deals in symbolic form with the burial, the planting of the seed, the growth, the fruition of the maize, the Maya, and generally the Mesoamerican staff of life. Yeah, the classical Maya were they reached uh, that cultural uh, apex in around AD 250. And... Um, where now are the forests of uh, Guatemala and southern Yucatan. There were dozens of Mayan cities with towering temple pyramids and um, tens of thousands of people living in them, uh, all conquering uh, the neighbors, uh, fighting, trading, and uh, sacrificing uh, uh, rival kings and princes. And then they grew the cacao tree. The scientific name of uh, the cacao tree is Theobroma cacao. And this has been given by the Swedish botanist uh, Carolus Linnaeus in his uh, Species Plantarum book. And basically, Theobroma cacao means food of the gods. Well, the Theobroma bit means translates food of the gods. And yeah, from that uh, fruit, from that extraordinary fruit of the tree, we get chocolate. And it's an extraordinary magnificent, fascinating transformation of the raw product to something completely different. And of course, with many properties, flavor profiles and properties that really excite um, the human uh, the human brain. So in today's episode, we are going to check a little bit more about the history of the tree. Where is the tree coming from? Uh, how it reproduces? Because there's so many individual extraordinary steps that takes us to the production of chocolate and each one is very fascinating and uh, extraordinarily rare to happen so yeah let's talk about uh, the chocolate let's talk about the cacao tree and find out how chocolate is made it's worth pausing here to think of our relationship with uh, chocolate now Cacao, as we eat it, chocolate, has lost a lot of its flavor, but also lost, crucially, all of its social and political and cultural content. We eat chocolate bars full of vegetable fats and sugar. We don't drink the cacao drink the ancient Aztec and Maya drank. We don't have chocolates with more than 75% cacao solids. The Mesoamerican civilizations used to have at least 98% cacao drinks. It's just so different. 
at this point, let's um, check a little bit about the, the cacao tree and how we make, and how the Mayans made chocolate from it. Was the process, and for centuries the process was the same up until like two hundred years ago. Or so, the tree itself, and with very few exceptions, it refuses to bear fruit outside a narrow band of twenty degrees north and twenty degrees south of the equator. Also, the altitude is very important, and if it's too high, then the temperatures will fall below 16 degrees Celsius, which is the minimum temperature that the tree requires. And of course, if the climate is very dry, then uh, again, the cacao tree is not going to grow properly. It needs year-round moisture. So firstly, there are three main varieties of cocoa tree, the Forastero, the Criollo, and the Trinitario. The least aromatic, and more common sadly, is the Forastero. But also it's robust and high yielding. Criollo on the other hand is fragile, with small yield, but best flavoured. Less than 1% of the world production is Criollo. Trinitario is a cross between the two. 14% of the world's production comes from this. In the early years of the 20th century, human greed for profits pushed many producing countries to destroy the Criollo trees and replace them with a stronger, more productive Forastero. The reason being that beans are sold at the same price per kilo, whatever the quality. And in reality, most plantations were small farms whose farmers were struggling to make ends meet and get enough money to buy the basic necessities of life. What to do but to replace uh, the low-yielding trees with Forasteros that could produce twice the quantity? It takes seven years for a cocoa seedling to grow into a tree that is mature enough to produce uh, pods. So how did it all begin? Cocoa trees, regardless of the variety, produce fruit all year round. Although there are two main harvests, in May and November. All start with small, tiny flowers, which in a mature cacao tree can number in the thousands. They grow in clusters directly from the trunk of the tree or of uh, large branches. So only 10 or 20% of the flowers are successfully pollinated. The rest do not receive enough pollen to create fruits. So the insects responsible for pollinating cacao's tiny flowers are themselves also tiny, in order to access the flowers, the productive structures. So these are the the midges, chocolate midges, very small flies with long complicated names, Keratopogonidae. No bigger than the size of pinheads, midges seem to be the only creatures that can work their way into the intricate flower to pollinate it. They are most active in their pollination duties at dusk and dawn, in sync with the cacao flowers, which fully open right before sunrise. Without the midges, there would be no chocolate. So the native habitat of chocolate midges is dense, shady rainforests, unlike the unnatural arrangement of cacao trees in commercial plantations. Also, within commercial plantations, the time of peak flower abundance is out of sync with the peaking of midges population. To make matters even less attractive to the midges, wild cacao flowers have more than 75 distinct aroma ingredients, while cultivated cacao flowers only have a few. The majority of cacao trees are what are known as self-incompatible, meaning they cannot pollinate themselves. So successful pollinators must pick up pollen from the male parts of a flower of one tree and deposit it on the female part of a flower of another tree. Also, cacao flowers are very short-lived, typically receptive to pollen for only one or two days, and flowers that do not receive ample pollen die and fall within 36 hours of opening. Evidence suggests improving the midge habitat uh, can increase fruit yield, and so in some cacao growing areas, current farming practices include developing and maintaining suitable ground habitat within and near cacao orchards, in an effort to increase the number of midges capable of pollen transmission. You see um, why cacao is so expensive and so difficult to have uh, big, uh, big yields. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever your needs, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK or 
you can visit the shop at Arch 17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London, Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. Hello, hello, this is Dr. Ran. And this is Dr. G. And together, we're the co-hosts of The Partial Historians. We love ancient Rome and all the quirks that humanity has to offer. Our podcast combines analysis, discussion about sources, and a good dash of irreverence. As lovers of the delicious legacy, we know you have an appetite for the delights of the ancient world. Join us for our narrative episodes as we explore the history of Rome from the founding of the city. Or perhaps you'd like to drop by for our special episodes on topics such as historical films, ancient personalities, academic guests, and our never-ending fight about who was the better emperor, Augustus or Tiberius. It's Tiberius. It's definitely Augustus. You can find The Partial Historians wherever you listen to quality podcasts, such as The Delicious Legacy. We're out and about on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And now, back to your regular program. The cacao pods grow straight out of the trunk as we've seen, and this looks like a gnarled and bulbous protrusion. As soon as the pods are ripe enough, they are cut from the tree with a machete. They grow close to the trunk, so this delicate operation is happening by hand, and never with machines, as it might damage the tree and make it vulnerable to disease. The pods are then piled together for a group of workers to open by hand. Within the pod, The beans lie wrapped in a thick protective coating of white mucilage, looking a bit like a bunch of grapes in a soggy cotton wool. This flesh of the fruit is edible, and it doesn't taste bad at all. I haven't tasted it, sadly, but I've seen in documentaries people eat it, and I've read that it's delicious and also very nutritious. So all this now is emptied in large baskets or containers. The mucilage is juicy and fresh, with delicate aromas that vary from one tree to another. The flavour profiles are honeyish, with faint vanilla aftertaste. Now this mucilage needs to be removed from the beans before processing, so most commonly, layers of the fruity pulp are put in wooden boxes with holes at the bottom and covered with banana leaves, which contain bacteria that enhance the fermentation process, liquefying the mucilage so it can drain away, leaving the beans. This process also brings out the precursors of the aromas that the resulting to the chocolate uh, will have. The fermentation should take five to seven days. These lengths of time are needed to give the cocoa bean aromas the best chance of developing. Once the beans are drained, the next step is to dry them to the point that they contain less than 8% moisture. This will prevent them from going moldy when shipped and can be stored for four or five years without going off. A slow dried bean, caressed dry by the sun at its less intense times, tastes completely different and almost always much more spectacular than one made from identical beans which were sun dried conventionally in well monitored rooms. After drying, the beans are put in 60 kilo jute bags and sprayed with chemicals to prevent damage from weevils, vermin or bugs. They are then sent on the long journey to the countries where they will be processed. Next stage is the roasting and the selling. So to bring out the chocolate flavor and colors, the beans are roasted. The temperature, time and degree of moisture involved in roasting depends on the type of beans being used and the type of chocolate being made. Thus, when the chocolate is made with a different blend of beans, beans are roasted separately and mixed afterwards. A winnowing machine is used to remove the cells from the beans to leave what are known as the cocoa nibs peeled beans transformed into chunks. At the factory, the nibs are then milled to create cocoa liquor, peeled and ground cocoa beans. This paste has the consistency of peanut butter and is at uh, last starting to smell something like chocolate. The cocoa liquor is pressed to extract the cocoa butter, leaving the solid matter called cocoa press cake. The machines used to do this are based on the one invented in the 19th century by a Dutch uh, chemist Van Outen. And this is the modern way of making chocolate, of course. 
Now, the process now takes two different directions. A, the cocoa butter is added to the cocoa liquor in the production of fine chocolate. And this is what uh, the book A True History of Chocolate tells us about the process. The quality, top, top quality chocolates. That's how it's made. And B, for most cheap chocolate that we buy nowadays, sadly, this is made with a combo of cocoa powder and vegetable fats, which is far, far cheaper than cocoa butter. All this cocoa butter that's been extracted, it's been sold to pharmaceutical companies and to the cosmetic uh, industry to make beauty products and all that stuff because cocoa butter melts, um, becomes liquid in, in body temperature. So it, all the stuff has been absorbed by the human body, blah, blah, blah. So next is conching. So now the paste is transferred to the concher, a machine which kneads and smooths the chocolate mixture for up to three days at a temperature between 60 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius. Here, the speed, duration and temperature of the conching affects the flavor. Conching also improves the texture and allows acidity to evaporate. Finally, after conching, we have tempering, where the chocolate mixture needs to be cooled to around 40 degrees to allow stable crystallization of the cocoa butter. Cocoa butter is basically made of six types of crystals which melt at different temperatures. By tempering, cocoa butter goes through a number of variations of temperatures and an inner grid of stable crystals is formed. The process produces a chocolate that is shiny and smooth with a homogeneous and silky texture. The melted chocolate eventually comes up out of a tap, which is every chocoholic's dream, I suppose, to open their mouth under a chocolate tap and drink as much pure chocolate as they can. Now, what does the cocoa percentage really mean? A 70% cocoa solid bar means that uh, the 70% of total weight comes from the cocoa beans. And now for a little recipe with um, chocolate. And this is uh, empanatigi, which is Sicilian chocolate meat cookies. We think this must be derived from the Spanish tradition of, of empanadas. And these are half moon shaped Sicilian cookies found in Modica. They're filled with a surprising but delicious combination of robust chocolate from the region, spices and ground beef. So the filling of the dough are simple, finely chopped candied fruit, cinnamon, nutmeg and sugar help the finished cookies stew mostly and become sweet and only lightly savoury, ideal for enjoying with a cup of coffee. A small window etched into the top of it shows off the unusual filling, so tasting them is the only way to fully comprehend uh, their unique flavor and texture. And to make them, basically, you, your dough is uh, flour, zero, zero flour, sugar, butter, and egg yolks. The filling is fatty ground beef, salt, chocolate, candied fruit, cinnamon, nutmeg, and egg whites. So you cook the beef in a pan, you pull the things in a blender, and with a round cutter, you cut the dough, you fill it, and you fold it and you cook it in 180 degrees Celsius oven for about 17 minutes. And now for the extra content for Patreon backers only, we're going to check the Chuao beans, which uh, Chuao is a coastal region north of Caracas in Venezuela, well known for its quality beans. It is said that in the 17th century, the Chuao plantation was given by an aristocratic Spanish woman to the Jesuits. So if you want to find out more, why don't you join me on Patreon to listen to the rest of the exclusive bits for Patreon backers only. On the next episode of the history of cacao and the history of the chocolate, we're going to explore the chocolate houses of Europe and how that reached uh, the palaces, the noble courts and um, the social uh, aspect of uh, chocolate in England and Europe in general. Right, and that's all for today's um, epic of the history of chocolate. So join me next week for more of chocolate's bittersweet history. To find out more about the Aztec chocolate and um, yeah, we'll talk about the European aspect of um, the cacao history. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Join me on Patreon, where you can get the podcasts early and ad free with extra content in the form of recipes. And of course, many other bonus material, such as um, my own personal recipes, photos, 
musings, essays, thoughts, and so on and so on. A gentle reminder that you can find the podcast on Spotify, Acast, YouTube, iTunes, Google Podcasts. So go forth and um, leave us a review and um, a rating, which helps, helps, helps really so much with people finding the podcast and uh, spreading the word around the podcast community. Thank you so much. See you next time.